And welcome. Thank you for making time to be with us this morning. Here at the CBS Family Service, we always look forward to a special time in worship and in the Word of God with you, our very special guests watching and listening to us from all over this country of Kenya and all over the world. My name is Reverend Grace Bukachi, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. We have a great service and worship experience lined up for you today. After praise and worship, led by our amazing team here on CBS, our service will include a message in our new series this month, Mission to the Family. Our speaker today is our immediate former first lady here at CETAM, Mrs. Nancy Oginde. We welcome you all, those of you listening to us on Hope FM, and those of you watching us on Hope TV and on all our Seatum Church online channels every Sunday at this local time. Our hashtag today is hashtag the family that prays. More about that later in the program and in this service. Karibuni sana. As always, let's get started with the praise and worship. And please help me welcome our amazing CBS worship team to lead us into the presence of God. If you're watching us at home, please, and you're able to rise up, rise up. But if you're not, you're in bed or in a place where you're not able to do so, remain in your position. But please, on the chat section, let us know. Put those clap emojis, those worship emojis, those dancing ones. Over to you, the CBS worship team, Karibuni Sana. Wherever you are, why don't you just rise up on your feet as we bless the name of the Lord. We desire that His name be lifted. Yeah. The glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise.
for then sings my song, my Savior God to Thee, the God who moves mountains, the Creator in heaven and earth. How great Thou! Ah. Uh-huh.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Indeed, oh, the glory of your presence. We, your temple, oh God, we bow in reverence of who you are. We thank you for your mercies this morning that are new to every last one of us. I thank you for that one watching in whatever part of the world they are in, that in that space, they're able to bow and say, Lord, feel, feel that space, feel that home, feel that hospital ward bed, feel that prison, oh God, feel. May your presence be so tangible. We thank you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You who knows our cares, you who understands our struggles, we surrender to you. We bow before you and we enthrone you as Lord again over and over and over our lives. Father, it's a joy to worship you, to be able to sing praises to you. We are deeply grateful. Thank you for receiving our sacrifice of worship. We pray this, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. What a great time in worship this morning and many thanks to our anointed worship team. If you've been blessed by this team today, why not say so? Yes, put those clap emojis, dance emojis, hands in the chat section on Facebook or on YouTube. And don't forget to use our hashtag today kindly, hashtag 
the family that prays. Notice the hashtag, the family that prays. Once again, if this is your first time with us on CBS, we would like to hear, like for you to know that you're very welcome. And yes, we want to hear from you. Feel right at home. Karibu sana. That's in Kiswahili in Kenya, meaning welcome. If you haven't done so before, please subscribe on our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon for notifications and reminders for future videos. Remember to use the hashtag as you tweet today. Once again, our hashtag for the day is hashtag the family that prays. Why not engage with us by posting something on our Twitter or Instagram page? Uh -huh. Let us know your thoughts and comments as you worship with us today. We will be welcoming our speaker for today, Mrs. Nancy Oginde, in a little while, sharing a message, speaking into the establishing of our family altar in our homes. And now as we continue, here are some important notices about our ministry. So please watch this clip. We are delighted to welcome you today to our CBS Family Service. If you are watching us on Hope TV or listening on Hope FM, or for those of you streaming live on our Sitem Church online social media platforms for the very first time, we extend a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us as we take time to worship and hear from God. On Tuesdays, please join us on Hope TV, Hope FM, Facebook, and YouTube at 5 p.m. for the After Sunday Live discussion where any questions you have about the subject of the sermon today will be addressed. We welcome you to join us on Wednesday for the live midweek prayer service from 6 p.m. broadcast on Hope TV and Hope FM and on all the Sitem Church online social media platforms. We invite you to send in your prayer requests before or even during the service. Our pastors will be praying with you and for you. Planning to get married? We encourage all our members to contact your senior pastor for direction on the steps to be taken in preparation for your wedding. Our pastors will conduct weddings, keeping strictly with the Ministry of Health guidelines, so please contact your pastor in good time to make arrangements. We express our deepest condolences to all who are bereaved. We wish to inform you that our pastors will be available to conduct funeral services strictly following the current protocols from the Ministry of Health. We will also conduct the burial service on site according to the current Ministry of Health protocols as well. Please contact your respective senior pastor for guidance. All our Sitem Church offices are open between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, strictly observing all current Ministry of Health protocols. Please remember that all our assemblies around Kenya are open for in-person services. Seating capacity is no longer limited, but all other Ministry of Health protocols still apply. Thank you for staying connected to the Sitem Broadcast Service. Thanks for paying attention to these notices. God bless you, and please enjoy the rest of the service. Welcome to the Sitam Springboard Missions Convention 2022 with a fresh anointing to radiate God's glory as we reach out to the lost. Join us at Sitam Valley Road from the 20th to the 24th of September at 2 p.m. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday and 5 p.m. on Tuesday. The convention is themed Till the Whole World Hears, and it will definitely revive and uplift your faith. Our anointed speakers include, among others, Bishop Callisto Odede, the presiding bishop of Sitam, a renowned and passionate international speaker on missions. Dr. Sami Wanyonyi, the founder and lead evangelist of Shine in the World Ministries, based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA. He has preached the good news of Jesus Christ to millions of people in North America, Africa, and Asia. Yes, in this world of bad news, in this world of fake news, the gospel is more relevant than ever before. Dr. George Ogalo, the Chief Operating Officer at the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, and Dr. Stanley Mukolwe, the Director of Family Life Ministry at The Navigators in Africa and a highly sought-after speaker on family ministry, parenting, mentoring, and leadership development. 
and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Matthew 24, verse 14. Do you want to be more effective in the mission field? Get ready, save the dates. The entrance to Springboard 2022 is absolutely free. And there is much more information on our website, springboard.ctam.org. Spread the word and use the hashtag Springboard2022. See you at Springboard2022. It's time now to give our offerings. And before we do that, please let, we, let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving us finances. Thank you for giving us material, even food in our farms and the crop, the, the animals in our sheds. Thank you, Lord for your blessings. As we give our tithes and offerings, oh God, as we bring these things to you, Lord, we ask that you will bless them. Thank you for providing for us in abundance, overwhelming us, oh God, even in times we didn't anticipate your blessing. You are good, oh God, and your mercies endure forever. So receive the sacrifices that we offer to you in the form of our tithes and our offerings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. It is now time to express our worship to God through giving. Thank you for your continued support of God's work here at Sidom. We believe that God, who sees in secret, will reward you openly and abundantly. We have a common payment platform for all our giving, irrespective of which assembly you happen to attend and even for our visitors. You can give via mobile money through the platforms M-Pesa or Airtel Money. The pay bill number for either system is 933934. For the account name, please indicate the SITEM assembly you attend. If you have joined us in this service but you are not a member of any SITEM assembly, just write offering in the account space. Please remember that all all other SITEM PayPal numbers remain operational. If you would like to make direct bank deposits, electronic transfers or PESA link, please use the following account. Account name, Christ is the Answer Ministries, Cooperative Bank, University Way Branch and the account number is 011-280-617-639-0. The SWIFT code K C double O K E N A. If you prefer to give through our website, kindly visit www.sitem.org. Click on the Give tab and follow the instruction for online giving. Once again, we want to appreciate every one of you for every gift, every tithe, every offering, and every generous material support. God bless you. It's time now to hear from the Word of God, and our preacher for the day is no stranger to the CBS family. We're delighted to welcome Mrs. Nancy Oginde, our immediate former First Lady here at CITAM. And the title of the sermon today is The Significance of the Family Altar. I am convinced you will be wonderfully blessed. Once again, the hashtag today is hashtag the family that praise. Welcome, Sister Nancy. Thank you very much, Pastor Grace. I really appreciate the kind words of introduction. God bless you. Good morning and praise the Lord. Today we are talking about the significance of the family altar. And indeed, it's a joy and a privilege to, to be able to be here. And thank you for tuning in. Why? Is the family altar important? Why the family altar in the first instance? Why is it significant? How do we manage the family altar and the challenges of mounting it? Those are the three things we shall be looking at this morning, and I trust that the Lord will guide us through. From creation, we see God creating man and woman, male and female. The Bible says he created them. And it seems to me 
as God tells man and woman to be fruitful and to multiply, he was not just thinking of the here and now. He was looking to the bigger picture of this man and this woman. He was going to fellowship with them. It seems he was creating them for fellowship. A man in his own image, in his own likeness. A little later, he makes him a manager, a steward of his creation, all of his creation. But he also wanted to fellowship with this man and did so on a daily basis. Genesis 1.26 tells us that the Lord used to come in the cool of the day and fellowship with the man. And then we read in Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, that God was looking for a godly offspring from this man, from Adam and his wife. So God had a plan for all those that would be born out of Adam and thereafter, that he would have this communion, this fellowship with him. And even after man falls and sins, God does not abandon Project Man. That's why Christ came and through his death on the cross, this reunion, this fellowship is restored. An altar, according to the definitions I could find, is a place de designated to meet with God. Abraham introduces altars to us. Wherever he went, he, after talking with God, he would put up an altar and worship God. Jesus himself is quoted in many places as going to a quiet place, to a groove of, of trees and praying, sometimes overnight, fellowshipping with his father. Now, we do not have to build altars like Abraham did or have special rooms or special structures or like I saw um, in the picture of a, an altar, have candles and all that. I believe simply an altar is a time and a place when fam the family comes together with the sole purpose of seeking God through the reading of the word, that's the Bible, singing praises in worship to God, praying together on a regular basis and preferably on a daily basis. Now, let me hasten to add there before we go on that Whereas we are saying family, and ordinarily family is man, wife, and children, I want to believe that even a couple who do not have children, they should have a habit of coming together. There is nothing like coming together in the presence of the Lord, so that when the children come, they will just join in into what has been going on. And I don't know, these days people don't share houses. In our days, we didn't have so much cash to get good houses. So we used to get two, three bedrooms and share two, three sisters together. And I recall in our house, we used to have devotions together every night before we went to sleep. And that bonds you and it forms a fellowship of, encourage, of encouragement. I believe the family altar and the altar, this fellowship with God was so key and is still so key that we find it being one of the very first things that Moses addresses when he is sending the, the children of Israel over to the promised land. The Bible says in Genesis from verse 1 to verse 7, it says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Verse 3, hear, O Israel, and be careful so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your heart, with all of your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. Verse 7 says, These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You could go ahead and read the entire chapter, but we will read uh, verse 20 later on. But the entire chapter is, is beautiful in terms of what Moses is saying. And Moses picks out for the children of Israel the blessings that they were going to receive after they obey this command. Look at what he tells them. Number one, in verse two, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. What is Moses saying? That teach these things to your children and their children so that they too, as you have feared me, as you have known me, they too will come to know me and to fear me and to walk in my ways. And then he says, if that happens, you will enjoy long life. So this is another, uh, another commandment with a promise that if they continue to fear the Lord and to walk in his ways and his decrees, and they will only do that if they have been taught the commands and the decrees of the Lord, and then they will enjoy long life. Secondly, if they are careful to obey, verse 3, it will go well with them. Now, that, that means a lot of things. When God says it will go well with you, it means his eye will be upon them. He will walk with them. He will remain in their midst as he had promised. And then he says, you, will, you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord promised your fathers. Increase here is not just increase in numbers, and God had already promised that that they were going to increase in numbers. But it is actually also increase in material things. You know, the things that we all uh, cr clamor for, we fight for, we long for. God is saying, if you obey my commands, if you follow my decrees, if you observe my laws, I will give you that and some more. You see, God is still looking for a people who are different, the way he looked for Israel, a people who will walk and fellowship with him and actively seek him, God, as Abraham did, and he was called the father of faith. Abraham's offspring was set apart and that's why God is telling them, continue as this set apart nation, different from all other nations, a people belonging to God, observing his law and walking with him, not as the other nations. And you know, we too have been called. We have been called, according to, second, to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we are a holy nation a people belonging to God. We are not just anybody. We are a people belonging to God, a people who should walk in his ways and in fellowship with him. Why? 
so that we may be an example to the other people who are around us. Matthew 18 verse 20 tells us, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be. The presence of the Lord in the home invites the presence of, uh, brings the family together. It becomes a God-centered life, a God-centered family. The family gets to encounter God together. As opposed to each person struggling to find God on their own, their family comes together and learns to encounter, to walk with God together. And indeed, doesn't it say, is it a, a Christiastes, can two walk together unless they be agreed? So whether it's a couple or it's an entire family, that agreement is critical for their walking together. The word of the Lord helps us to shape our values, our convictions. Indeed, it shapes our character in a world that is full of strange things. You know, in our day, there wasn't so much information as there is today. I, I sympathize with our children and the young people. They are exposed to so much information. Some of it good, but most of it quite some wickedness. Who will help them to sift through all this information, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and to know what they should take and what they should not touch or go near? The Word of God helps our children, and indeed all of us, to form firm foundations of faith and of the way that we should go. Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn away from it. Even if they do not get saved at our family altar, our family devotions, the seed, the seed of God's word is already planted in their hearts. And in God's own time, they will come back to the Lord. It will bear fruit because that's the promise of God, that not a single word will go, will come back to him empty. In 2 Timothy, Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, Paul speaking to Timothy says to him, I've been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded, I imagine that he, Paul was persuaded by what he saw in Timothy, that the faith had been passed on from grandmother Lois, mother Eunice, and eventually to Timothy. So God is not a God of chance. He is saying here, this, he told Moses, teach it to your children and, your, their, and their children, so your, great, your grandchildren. And here he's saying, the faith that was in Lois, in your mother Eunice, and now lives in you. So it's a continuum. God is creating a continuum of faith so that we can get to Malachi chapter 2, a godly generation for rich season of life. Where else would this happen except really in the home? The home is the cradle where we are formed and shaped. When the cradle functions as God intended and provides a safe environment for learning, for correction, for change to occur in the course of our growing up, especially if it is in the presence of God and a loving and nurturing environment, then we are shaped into being the kind of people that God is looking for. And do I dare say, not just in the biblical sense, but even for the nation. You know, sometimes you see people and how they are behaving, you wonder, 
Where did this one come from? Did they grow up in a place where there was, you know, other people, where they had a father, a, a mother, or where they were in a society? Or did they just happen so that everything goes? Psychologists tell us that the first six years of life are critical to the development of the personality. The first six years of life. In fact, some of the materials are telling us that even before, when a child is in the womb, they pick up some of the things that are going on. Like if the mother is depressed, it is likely going to affect the baby who is in her womb. What then should we do? They say that the brain of the child collects so much information in these first years. And there are some who will argue, even up to age 16, they are still picking up information. They are still picking up our conduct. They are still picking up how we behave, how, how we talk, how we treat other people. And their brains are so fast. In fact, uh, I read an article and it was talking about they are processing billions of nuances in their heads. And the ones that they perceive and understand, they keep. And that's what forms their personality. The task of undoing that is a story of another day because it gets entrenched in their brains. And to get it out becomes an issue. And perhaps we can agree with that. As I was preparing this, I thought about things I remember. And I can't believe it. My nursery rhymes. You, I can sing them word perfect. The things we memorized, I can say them word perfect. The things we learned in Sunday school as children, I still remember them. Some of the verses that I know are the ones that I learned at that age. But try to make me memorize anything today, even a name, it becomes a problem. The question then is, who is helping to shape and to form your children, their brains, their conduct, their values, everything. Who is helping to shape them? And even if you're the one who is shaping them, on what are you basing the shaping? Are they being shaped by the house health? By the television? Dare I say, are they being shaped by the teacher? Because these days, even the teacher may have completely different ideas of God from what you hold. Who is shaping the convictions and values of your teens? Who are their role models in matters of life and matters spiritual? The family altar observance helps the family address these issues in a very non-threatening way. Understand each other's struggles as, as you share prayer requests and celebrate answered prayer. As you discuss the Bible verses, the truths come out. As we model to our children that, hey, even us, we are vulnerable. We depend on God. Dad also walks by faith in God. He asks for prayer uh, requests on things that he is grappling with. It's not just a teenager who has issues. Dad has difficulties in the office. Mom has a problem. There are many matters in the family. There is sickness. And we are praying over all these things. And we are looking at what does the word of God say concerning sickness, concerning money. What has God promised? That shapes the thinking in the minds of the children and their values in terms of when they come to that situation, they will remember 
my mother, I'm sure many of you have had your child telling you, mom, please pray because they have something going on. Sometimes it's the exam because they know we want good grades. So they will tell us to pray for the exam. We teach them to and, and model to them concern for others by praying for family friends or their friends, by praying for the extended family, by praying for our nation, as we have been doing in this last season. We model godly values that Moses said. You know, he said, teach them the commands. The commands are orders to be obeyed. Teach them the decrees. The decrees are those things that are non-negotiable according to the word of God. Teach them the laws. The laws are the rules and regulations of how to live. We teach them and we model them as we go along in life. I suggest that the home is the safest place where children can be formed and shaped to be introduced to God and faith. A safe place for them to develop thinking patterns, habits, convictions that will carry them through life. And you know, God knew all this all along. The word is so clear. Proverbs 22 verse 6 tells us, train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. God knew before the psychologists that we need to train the children and form this great foundation of the persons that they will become. Psalm 19 verse 7 tells us, the law of the Lord, that is the word of God, is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes, that is the demands, of the Lord are trustworthy and they make wise the simple. So our children are simple. They're, they're learning, they're growing. The word of God, if we fellowship around the word of God, it will help them to grow and to be what God would have them to be. And to be the men and the women they were created to be. To attain those places that God designed for them. So how do we conduct this family time, this devotion time, this altar, you know, family altar? How do we um, conduct it? Verse 7 to 9, actually, of, of what we read. Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, impress them, that is the commands, the decrees, and the laws, Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Yani, talk about these commands everywhere and all the time. Every moment is a teaching, a teachable moment. Impress them on your children. The word impress, we use it these days, you know, for looking good and impressive or performing and all that. But it has another meaning, which is make them understand, help them to understand these things that are written in the book. Help them to become familiar with the demands of scripture, with what God says. Help them to appreciate the importance and the value of the word of God. You know, isn't it amazing how we jump over hoops and all manner of barriers, including, you know, employing private tutors and paying the teachers to ensure that our children pass the exams, get a good education. But you know, there is something here that is of a greater value than education, our education. Psalm 119 verse 130 says, The entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. Meaning, when the word of God permeates in our lives, it helps us 
to perceive and to understand correctly. It helps us when we are making decisions to know how things are delineated right and, and wrong. It makes it clearer. In another verse it says, your word is a lamp unto my path. God knows where we are going and how we ought to go. Not just when we are 6 or 10 or 13 or 16, but even when we are 40, God will guide and direct us. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, it makes wise the simple. How does one become wise? What is wisdom? Isn't it when we see somebody who behaves with decorum, who talks with decorum, who makes sense, as they navigate through their life. I don't know about you, but <laughs> have you ever met an educated, educated people? You know, some educated people, I don't want to call them what the Bible calls them, but their lives and their homes are a wreck. I mean, you're looking and you're like, excuse me, this fellow should know better. This woman should know better. Some of them very wealthy, but living or the family is living in misery. Why? They are not wise. There is nothing to guide their path. Ecclesiastes 4.13 says, better to be poor but wise than to be a rich fool. It it's, uh, mirrors Deuteronomy 6.3 when the Bible says that when we obey the command of the Lord, it will make our way prosperous. We need to do whatever is in our power. Whatever is in our power. To at least create this atmosphere in our home. So that at the end of it, when the children are gone, when the grandchildren are gone, we can say, I did my part. As a dad, as a grandpa, as a mom, as a grandma, I did my part. How do we do it? What methods then do we employ? Now, this vary from person to person. Um, Doctrines, I know like um, in the mainland churches, they teach the children through catechism. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 tells us, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all scripture is God-breathed. Every verse is God-breathed. And it is useful for our growth, for our becoming, whatever it is that God designed for us to become. What is teaching? Teaching is explaining the scriptures in a language that the family can understand. The young children, the adult children, the teenagers, it is customizing the scripture, so that every person in the family fellowship gets to appreciate what the word of God is saying to them. <laughs> and you know, this book addresses everything. I, I, I mean, everything. I'm yet to find something that is not in the Bible. The other day, we, we, we were having our devotions, <laughs> and we've been reading Proverbs. In our house, we we allow everybody to have a say on what we are going to discuss for the next while. So this was one of the books that was suggested, I think, by our son. So we've been reading Proverbs for quite a while now. So we were in Proverbs 31, <laughs> verse 2 and 3. I'm not going to read it. And I think Dad was not in that day. So we read it, and I see verse 2 and 3, and I'm like, uh-huh. How does one explain this one to a young man? And I had to, because it's there, and we are discussing each verse. So I had to explain. 
what it means in his language, in a way he can understand. The word is telling us rebuking. The word of God will often address real life issues. Family devotions is not the time to discipline. But it's a time to explain the scripture so that the hearts of listeners are convicted by the spirit of God. If something, you know, however, is addressed, you know, and there is a situation that is going on, then I think we are within um, the limits if we, you know, if we point out the authority of scripture over the, you know, ongoing conduct of the individual. Psalm 141 tells us, 141 verse 5 tells us, let a righteous man strike me, it is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it is oil on my head. My head will not re refuse it. Meaning, when the word of God addresses something that we probably are walking in and is not right before God, and we happen to be, you know, in that press, uh, in that forum, then it will convict us. But if it's in a family situation and there is something known, then I believe it is good to point it out. Correcting. This refers to pointing out areas that are in contradiction to the word of God, explaining why, and helping the family members to understand what the word of God is saying and juxtapose it against the conduct that may be prevalent. I, 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 I remember um, we were discussing, I can't even remember, I think we were reading Leviticus or some book, and our daughter talked about tattoos. And, you know, we had a very robust discussion, and it went on for a while. I, I actually don't think it's quite closed. But we were able to look what, at what does the word of God say about tattooing our body, about markings on our bodies. I don't mean that a family devotion is a time to do Bible exposition. In any case, it should be short, you know, in accordance to, to the age of the children. But it's a place to have conversations around the word of God, interactions around what the Bible says. We said we take every opportunity to make sure that we teach and give reasons and the benefits associated with following the commands and the decrees of the Lord. That's what Moses tells them, that they take every opportunity. They were to teach them, their children and grandchildren, everywhere and everything so that they would learn to love and to, fe to fear the Lord. Now, we ourselves as Christians have embraced this culture of being Christians. You see, we are no longer following, at least most of us, I pray, there are some who are going back to the traditions, but we are no longer following the traditions of our fathers. We are following this new culture as Christians, we are walking with the Lord. It behoves us then that we teach our families these commands of this God that we have embraced, that we teach them to follow the, the decrees of the Lord so that they become beneficiaries of this new kingdom that we have enjoined ourselves to. Please note that obedience to the laws and the decrees does not purchase for us salvation. That comes by grace, for salvation is by grace, not by works. Where and when do we teach? Where and when do we hold this family altar? Do we have to find a special place? Do we have to make sure that we have it at 5 a.m. in the morning, the first watch at 4 a.m. in the morning? Where and when do we have this family altar? 
time, unfortunately, there is always limitation. You see, the people of Moses' time were pastoralists, and they spent time with their children as they did the chores, as they, whatever they were doing. So they had time to teach as they went along. But now, in our age, with work and school and all manner of meetings, it becomes really hard. And in our case, in, especially in Nairobi, driving from one end of the city to the other to take children to school and then picking them in the evening. By the time you get home, they are tired and sleepy and can hardly finish their homework, and eat before dozing, and the process is repeated day after day. Yet the word is telling us we must employ every effort to make time. The call is actually tie them on your, on your hands, on, on your hands, and mark them on your foreheads and the door frames. The call is really to make sure that our children walk and are helped in this walk in learning what God requires. Most people have de do devotions before dinner or after dinner. This calls for sacrifice. May I say, especially for dads, please block your calendars for this time. One hour at least so that you have some time you know, to eat and then to read the word together and pray together. I'm cognizant that moms have been caught up with their office and business rules, which only actually makes the situation worse because then it means devotions are done once a week, if at all. But we must make time. I remember when our daughter was young, we used to live in a place where it would take 45 minutes to get to her school every morning. It was hard. It was really hard. Because by the time we get home, and the journey back, we would get home at 7. It was so difficult because by the time you get home, you want her to finish the homework. You want her to bathe, to eat, and go to sleep early because she must wake up so early so, to start the journey again. So what we did, we, we decided to do our devotion in the car in the morning. So we had 45 minutes of devotion every morning. And really, that really helped. By the time Joyce was six years, she could actually lead the devotion in the car in the morning. It, it, it was, you know... And that was a God idea because otherwise we were stuck. But the key thing here is we must make time to ensure that we are running a consistent family altar, but it requires deliberate effort. It calls for much patience, prudence in terms of organizing ourselves. Creativity also is called for because they get bored or very easily get bored. But the price is worth it. There are many methods of going about it. Choose a book of the Bible and work through it. In our house, I said we, we, choose, we use books. You can also have a devotional book. There are many in the, book, in the Christian book, uh, bookshops, and they have a reading plan and explanations for each day. You can also pick a Bible character and go through the, you know, uh, the Bible looking at this character and how they are portrayed. And you can also study a topic, like you can pick the miracles of Jesus. For young children, Bible sto stories work best because they keep their interest. Sometimes they want you to read the story over and over again. And you can read the stories direct from the Bible or get those Bibles with illustrations. They love the illustrations and it holds their attention. So there is lots, that, you know, lots of ways that you could do it. The idea is creativity here. When and what time, again, you know, that is hard. It depends on the family. How do you handle resistance? When 
the young people are asking you, do we have to go through this? Do we have to study the Bible? How do you handle the resistance? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20. The Lord anticipated resistance because he says, in the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, the Bible says, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and, he, and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land that he promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord then commanded us to obey these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper. I think we can simply say when there is resistance, we have to give a reason. Let our reason be our testimony. Why do we have to read the Bible? Why do we have to pray? Why, why? It's so critical to answer those questions because they are asking genuinely. And therein it gives us an opportunity to give them a testimony how we came to know the Lord, what the word of God means to us, why we pray, what the Bible is all about, what the promises of prosperity and everything else that we want means from the word of God. It gives the resistance, God help us, eh? sometimes we get upset, but the resistance provides us an opportunity to turn the tables around and have them listen to our testimony and to the reasons why we should be reading the word of God. Let them know who you are. Let them know why you believe and what difference believing and trusting God has made in your life. I know, I know today we talk of don't force it down their throat. You have to work with them. If you push them, you will turn them off the gospel. I'm old school. Really? How come we push them to bring A's home? How come we push them to learn all manner of musical instruments? We push them into sports, swimming, football, baseball, or whatever, hobbies. And we justify it is good for their wholesome development. So why should we not push the word of God? Um, a friend of mine told me this story the other day. I don't have her permission, but she told me the story of her mom. There were 10 of them, 10 children. And she says ma their mom used to wake up at 6, well, maybe before, but at 6 on the dot, their mom would be praying loudly. I guess in a village house, there is no ceiling, so you can hear what everybody is saying in the other room. And she would start praying. And then in the middle of her prayer, she would call somebody at random, so-and-so, Jane, continue. Woe unto you, if you did not continue, there would be hell to pay. And you know, she told me, Sister Nancy, do you know all my brothers and my sisters are walking with the Lord today? We were very poor. But mom introduced us to the Lord. Not just that, all of them studied up to university level, some beyond. And you tell me it's not profitable? I believe the word of God is pro profitable, like we have read in Corinthians, in Timothy chapter 3. There is another example, not a very lovely one. 
The story of Ellie or Eli, depending on the, whether you went to the group of schools, the priest who failed to instruct and restrain his sons, and God judged him. And not just him, God judged his sons. They actually died on the same day. And all his future generations were cut off from ever being priests. That is 1 Samuel chapter 2. It's such a tragic story. I do not know how Eli failed to instruct his children. Maybe he tried and they didn't listen. But God is a just God, so he would not judge him unfairly. But notice, he is judged, his sons are judged, his grandchildren, and all generations of Eli are cut off from being priests. And it is worse. If you read it, it, it is worse. The Bible says that they will be begging other priests to give them food because the priests were supposed to eat from the, from the temple or from the offerings of the people. Verse 29 is even more tragic. First Samuel 2 verse 29, it says, Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I have prescribed for my dwelling? This is God speaking to Eli. Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts? <laughs> People of God, I do not know we are in this generation of the 21st century, but God is telling his servant that in failing to restrain his children, in failing to tell them what God required so that he does not offend them, maybe. So maybe Eli was old. Maybe he feared his sons were strong and they would kill him. Whatever, I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us the reason. But God is saying, whatever the excuse the servant of God had of refusing to restrain his sons, he honored them. He feared them more than he feared God. May God have mercy on us. Do I fear my job? Do I fear my promotion? Do I fear poverty more than I fear God so I'm working day and night? God forbid that we should honor our children, our husband, our wife, or anybody for that matter or any situation above the Lord our God and fail to point out any sin, fail to warn them what the word of God says. God forbid that we should spend our time making millions, billions, donating to major causes, uh, bringing huge tithes to church, being respected and honored, but arrive in heaven and our children are not there. Or even more painful, and I really would like my son and my daughter to be in heaven. Can you imagine arriving there and finding Joseph is not here? Where is Chris? I don't know whether in heaven we'll be capable of feeling sorrow, but I just imagine it would be heartbreaking. But even worse, we are here walking with the Lord, but our children, we didn't teach them. We didn't point them to the Lord. So they are living lives. I don't know what word to describe them. The lives that we see in our city. God forbid that we would see what we have observed in our society. Young people who call evil good who are not embarrassed of things that should not be mentioned in the right-thinking society. God forbid that it should happen in our homes. And even if it does, my prayer is that even if it does, it will not be because we failed to put the counsel of God before them 
but it will be because we did our part, but somehow they resisted and they turned away from it. But we cannot do what we please, do our own things, and imagine that they will turn out right. It doesn't happen. The Swahili told us, Ukiona chaenea, kimeundwa. Somebody put a lot of work in it. If you see a, a right standing young man, young woman, somebody has put work. They may not even be Christians, but they have taught them values. They have taught them how to conduct themselves. May God have mercy on us and on our society. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we bow before your holy presence. We thank you, Lord, because you are a speaking God. And we pray this morning, may the entrance of your word bring light to us as individuals, to our families, O oh God. And may we be found faithful in observing what you teach us. We honor you, we exalt you. In Jesus' name, pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The Lord bless you. Let me bring on Pastor Grace. Thank you, Pastor. You can take it up. What a blessing to have you join us for the service today. We are always blessed to have you share your experience and your thoughts after worshiping with us today. Please share the link for today's service online with someone who may have missed it. Send the link from our online channels on YouTube and on Facebook. We look forward to seeing you again during this week. And on Tuesday, join us on Hope FM, on Hope TV, Seedham Church Online, Facebook, and the YouTube channels at 5 p.m., uh, especially on Tuesday, uh, for the After Sunday Live discussion where any question you have about the subject of the sermon today will be addressed live by Mrs. Nancy Oginde. Join us also on Wednesday when we invite you to join with us in our midweek prayer service at 6 p.m. live here on Hope FM, Hope TV, and all our Seatum Church online platforms, social media platforms. Our pastors will be praying for your requests, so please send them in early. Hallelujah. Amen. And please do so. Please keep tweeting and posting and share your feedback on today's message. And remember to use the hashtag, hashtag the family that prays. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, hallelujah, I celebrate you. So please let us know by contacting the following WhatsApp number 0728 221. 2 to 1 on your screen right now. Please let us know. We will rejoice. We will reach out to you. We will follow you up this week. And I'm so grateful that you tuned in today. Even those of you who already know Jesus Christ, it is a joy to have shared this service with you today. Shall we pray and bow down our heads? And even as I sing this benediction, Lord, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord shine his face toward you and give you peace. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you.